Welcome to episode 223, The Ideal Progress Note, Myths, Methods, and Best Practices, featuring Dr. Ajeta Robinson, Dr. Melissa McCaffrey, Beth Rontel, LICSW, Barbara Griswold, LMFT, and Elizabeth Irias, LMFT. Make sure to subscribe to be alerted about future episodes by Clearly Clinical. Learn, grow, shine. This episode was proudly sponsored by Freed. Our AI medical scribe listens, transcribes, and writes notes for you. Visit getfreed.ai to learn more. Use code COUCH50 to get $50 off your first month when you subscribe. Hello to our listeners. My name is Beth Irias, and I am just so excited today because I have such an astounding group of clinical documentation experts here today. And we're doing this panel interview, uh, a conversation about progress notes. We are going to do our best to cover as much as we can in an hour, knowing that each of us could fill much more time talking about progress notes. Uh, And we're also almost inevitably going to step over each other a little bit uh, as we talk. So bear with us in our recording. Um, I am delighted to introduce you uh, to who I consider to be the documentation divas. I will start um, just naming them and then we'll go back for brief introductions. First, we have Dr. Ajeta Robinson. We have Dr. Uh, Melissa McCaffrey. We have Barbara Griswold and also Beth Rontel. Um, I am, again, just really excited. I don't think it's very often that we can get these different minds in the same space together to educate. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted to have you. And let me start by inviting Dr. Jetta Robinson. Why don't you please introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Absolutely. And as always, it's a pleasure. Um, I am a licensed clinical professional counselor and founder of Mastering Insurance, where we help clinicians master both the credentialing and billing process. I'm also a proud owner of a pro-insurance um, private practice here in Maryland. Fantastic. Thank you, Ajeta. And how about you, Dr. Melissa McCaffrey? Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa McCaffrey, a licensed psychologist, founder of QA Prep, where I help therapists with documentation and especially with catching up on paperwork when they fall behind, and the author of the new and upcoming book, Stress-Free Documentation for Mental Health Clinicians. Very exciting. Thank you. And I understand you have another specialization that you've been building out that we're going to talk a little bit about today, which is artificial intelligence and clinical documentation. So I'm excited to have Melissa here just share about that. Uh, Next, Barbara Griswold. Barbara, tell us about yourself. Hey, I'm Barbara Griswold. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm author of Navigating the Insurance Maze, the Therapist's Complete Guide to Working with Insurance and Whether You Should which covers a lot of ground. I I basically started out uh, to help people work with insurance, but then got into documentation because, man, so many people who were contacting me had documentation issues and audit issues. So that's my current jam. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Barbara. And last but not least, Beth Rontel. I am a licensed independent clinical social worker, and I founded Documentation Wizard 12 years ago. I help private practice therapists turn their clinical documentation into their their clinical skills and intuition into a structured, effective, and simplified documentation process. Um, I teach a course called Misery or Mastery, Documenting Medical Necessity, and other courses and do consultations and more and more paperwork that people are asking for. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Beth. Um, I will introduce myself for those of our listeners who don't know about my background. Um, Bethy Riaz, licensed marriage to family therapist. I have been doing documentation training and more specifically utilization review training, which is the process through which we advocate for insurance authorizations. Um, Usually my work focuses more on larger companies um, and helping them improve uh, clinical documentation in order to maximize insurance authorizations for clients in behavioral health care services. So that's kind of my jam. And as we dive into this topic, as I said earlier, there's only so much we can talk about in an hour. And also one of the really interesting and unique things that I think will probably bubble to the surface in our conversation today is the fact that there are so many different perspectives about what needs to be in clinical documentation. Um, We don't have a national standard when it comes to clinical documentation. We do have some 
companies or organizations that say, oh, for Medicare, this is how we prefer to see it. Or if you work with Optum uh, Insurance, for example, here are some of the um, perhaps guidelines that they might like to see in your notes, but it's not like there's this standard. And that makes it really complicated for clinicians to know what to do. Um, and I want to just come out of the gate and say that because you may hear things in this conversation today that number one, weren't what you were trained. <laughs> like That certainly happens in my trainings. Um, and also that may be in conflict with each other. And I think that speaks to the richness of the talk of, topic of clinical documentation and the fact that on some level, we're still in the wild, wild west when it comes to what's okay and what's standard and what are people doing? How do we find a standard of care, quote unquote, within that? Um, so with that preface, um, I would like to ask the four of you, would anybody like to add to what I just said before we move on to our first real meaty question? Barbara, go for it. <laughs> I want to say that, yeah, insurance plans are go further than say what we prefer. They do have requirements that they, they do issue. And yeah, they're not always, there's always, they leave themselves a lot of vagueity so they can still nail yep. you. <laughs> um, but I would say, yes, you can usually contact an insurance plan and you can get a list of their documentation requirements. So unfortunately, you know, that's something that we, or fortunately, it's something that we do have some level of guidelines. So, Thank you. And thank you for pointing that out. Um, one of the pieces, if we don't cover it, that I want to bring up, if you work with any third-party payer, whether that's a grant or that's your insurance company, certainly, as Barbara said, be reaching out to them and ask for guidance. How are you determining whether or not it's okay to use a certain insurance code or, excuse me, billing code and not another one? Are we doing a 50-minute session or an 80-minute session, for example? Or what about start stop, stop times? Um, is there a particular note format? That's a question that I get asked a lot. Um, so, Certainly, as I said, know what your pay source is requiring and requesting and know that we all have different backgrounds of like what pay sources we're working with, whether that's quote unquote cash pay or private pay, or that's um, particular like mainstream insurance companies or things like Medicare or other um, state based funding sources. So with that said, um, I'm just going to dive right in. Let's talk about progress notes. This is <laughs> so complicated. Um, there are so many myths that I think float around, and I want to try to unpack some of those today. Why don't we start in a conversation about the perfect progress note? Um, going down the list, and I want to say, I'm talking about your standard 50-minute non-crisis session. And if anybody wants to pick that up as to why I say non-crisis, go for it. Um, but let's talk about your average 50-minute outpatient mental health progress note. What is a perfect progress note? Is there a perfect length? And then we'll start kind of unpacking these different components um, that we as a field may not often talk about or consider. Um, with that, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and jump in, Dr. Ajeta Robinson. Yeah, so I don't think that there's a perfect length. Um, I think there's a quality of that note, which is very subjective. Um, I think it needs to be clear that medical necessity is met in that, that documentation. I think oftentimes what I notice happens is, is that, um, especially, you know, this happens whether you're a neuroclinician or not, depending on how you were trained. Um, I think oftentimes there's more um, casual language uh, in those progress notes, uh, for lack of a better word, that uh, means something very different, right? And doesn't necessarily align with the goals um, of therapy and or the diagnostic criteria of therapy. And so I think folks struggle with how to capture that information in a progress note. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought up medical necessity. Um, for listeners who are not as familiar with that concept, I'm going to take a quick stab at it and then also direct you to some resources. Effectively, medical necessity is required for psychotherapeutic services in the sense that we need to be there to do something. So just like a doctor is seeing a patient to provide a service and treat something, we need to do the same. And it doesn't matter what pay source it is. Um, it may be scrutinized differently based on the pay source and you know conversations about what um, 
diagnosis code is covered or isn't with this insurance plan, that's a separate conversation. But really, when somebody comes into our office or we meet them online and we're providing care, we need to be caring for something. And that's really what medical necessity is. And this other component is that our documentation needs to reflect that. So someone reading a note should be able to say, oh, this person is there because they've had an increase in panic attacks and they've also um, been struggling with some pretty severe insomnia. Then, as Dr. Robinson had said, we're looking at it to make sure that if our treatment plan is to target those, um, then our progress notes need to be indicating that. And we're working with some concrete objectives to achieve those goals, whatever they may be. So thank you for bringing up medical necessity there. Um, going back to kind of the detail and a progress note and feel free to build on medical necessity, I'm going to ask you to, to jump in, uh, Dr. Melissa McCaffrey. Yeah, I think this is the benefit of having very little guidance and also the downside. The perfect progress note is the one that is perfect for that individual session. And so to break this down into a really specific example, one example I like to use is quotes. Like, do you, do you put client quotes in the progress note? Well, yeah, sometimes they are the perfect thing to put in and sometimes they are the perfect thing to leave out. So the example I like to use is let's say a client comes in and they are talking to you about being really frustrated with their ex-spouse. And they say, I'm so mad at him right now. I just, I feel like I could just kill him. I just get so mad sometimes I could just kill him. <laughs> and we all know that in most circumstances, someone is saying that using hyperbole because they're just frustrated and they're venting. And we've all, like many of us have used that phrase in different circumstances. You do not want to use that as a client quote, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, the, yes, you are accurately documenting that the person said something. It is reflecting how angry they are. And that would be a very poor choice to put that in your note based on the context. And some of us, including myself, have had the rare occasion where someone has said that and meant it. And in that circumstance, you do want to put that direct client quote in there because it is explaining why you then took whatever actions you took <laughs> and you're documenting it for a very different reason. So that's kind of an extreme example, but it highlights how there is there will always be nuance to progress notes. And that is why there's no specific guidance from our um, ethics standards, et cetera. And it's a good thing we have that flexibility. Thank you. I appreciate that example. It's very illustrative. And also your point about that nuance, I think that actually is a perfect transition. Barbara, you had kind of mentioned sometimes what we see as a deficit in clinical documentation may also be an asset. And Melissa kind of just nodded or uh, took a nod to that as well. Barbara, what are your thoughts? What is a perfect progress note? Is there a perfect length? Like how, how do you feel with this one? <laughs> Not length. Absolutely. It's about quality. There are certain things that need to be in every progress note. And I think this is something that people don't get. Uh, they kind of feel like, well, I talked about that in last week's progress note. No, every progress note needs to have the diagnosis. Every progress note needs to have the start and stop times um, of the session, the actual ones, not the scheduled ones. There are certain things that every note should have. We talk a little bit about medical necessity, but it doesn't have to actually back up the diagnosis, that's great. But sometimes, you know, you, the diagnosis is anxiety disorder, but they walk in that day and their dog just got hit by a car and they're dead. You know, they're, they're not going to back up anxiety when the client is <laughs> depressed in that session. So you need to back up the, what is the client's mood, emotions that you are treating and what are the interventions you're giving based on that, that mood. Unfortunately, what I see a lot is that what people are writing, and, and uh, uh, um, I, th I think it's kind of personal growth work. They'll be writing like, oh, I, my, I was mad at my husband because he left the towels on the floor, and I advised them, blah, blah, blah. And that's stuff that if insurance looks at that, they'll say, I'm not going to cover that, right? <laughs> so when we talked about medical necessity, insurance has to believe for them to cover it, that it's not personal growth, normal life stuff, normal conflicts you're going to have with your husband. You have to basically say, or your partner, that this is something that addresses some kind of diagnosis, distress, impairment. So we have to kind of, in every note, be like arguing <laughs> that. And I would say, though, for your personal growth clients, the ones who are paying out of pocket, if they just want to talk about the, the towels, that's fine. I, I Maybe I'd make a little argument there that 
a client can come in and talk about whatever they want to do personal growth work. That's totally different. They don't need to have medical necessity. Um, there needs to be some sense that we're doing a good work in response to whatever our client's bringing in. But I don't think medical necessity applies unless insurance is on board here. There. Um, I have a couple things that I'm thinking about, and one is that although I really, I really agree with you, Barbara, that um, if there is absolutely no insurance involved, then medical necessity doesn't need to be proved. However, medical necessity has become the standard of documentation, and so if notes are subpoenaed or there's a board complaint and your notes will automatically be called into question, then you're going to be judged on whether your notes meet medical necessity. And that's um, not something I don't, I think any of us like to think about. Um, I don't like it, but I think it's a reality. And how I conceptualize a note is that the diagnosis is the hypothesis. When we're writing a note, we're basically writing an outline of what happened. So the diagnosis is the hypothesis, and the symptoms support the diagnosis, and everything else in the note is the supporting evidence, like how the client appears, what the information, what interventions you use, what your assessment is, what your progress is. And then the conclusion of this experiment is medical necessity. And there are specific things that need to be include, included that you said, Barbara. Um, the problem is that even the definition of medical necessity is really vague. It gives a few specific elements that need to be included, like sight, duration, um, that the client is motivated and engaged, but at the very end of that definition, it says, and this is a quote, and any other factors. So that's the gotcha moment. Thank you for that, Beth. And that this is actually a perfect example of why I kind of led with what I did, because we all come from different backgrounds. And for me, relying heavily on the law and ethics side of things and a liability reduction point. One of the things that I've trained, I've certainly heard from clinicians. We, you know, I, I know we've all heard it. I only accept cash. I don't take progress notes. I don't keep them. Or I keep very brief progress notes. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara just covered up her face. Um, and one of the things that I've seen happen, because many people who are in private practice or an agency have a combination of both. You know, they may have some Medicare clients, they may have some Blue Shield clients, they may have cash. And one of the things that I have thought about and, and train, especially with larger facility, facilities, if we were to open up all of these charts and lay them out, and if we were looking at the documentation as a reflection of the quality of care, which like, let's face it, that's how that's going to be evaluated. It would start to appear if we kept better notes for our insurance clients, it would start to appear that we were giving better care to insurance clients, that we were more awake at the wheel, if you will. Um, and if we had really vague cash notes, because they you know, weren't as likely to be audited, but could still be audited, as you pointed out, like as a subpoena or, or whatever their situations could come up, disability claims, things like that, um, then we have really done a disservice to our cash paying clients. And this is part of kind of the complexity here. Um, it's, it's being aware of who is your pay source and also like, what does our documentation say to the reader about the quality of our care? Um, that's one thing that I'm always considering. And like I said, I, I never want to give the impression that if I'm getting money from Medicare, I'm doing better care. But if someone hands me a check, I'm like, client was present uh, in session, <laughs> period, end note. <laughs> um, so my thought on the perfect length, um, to piggyback on everybody, there isn't one. Um, and also what I'm hearing too is this consideration about medical necessity and what is the reader getting when they're reading it, um, you know, th to the point about what quotes are you including or are you making illustrations so that the reader understands what you were doing in session. And I think really for me, and I'm dating myself here, progress notes are cliff notes. 
Um, they're not the novels. I call myself a novel writer in recovery uh, because I totally burned myself out early on and had to get better friends with the cliff notes and understanding the highlights. Um, so from there, kind of into our, our next topic, um, what are some of the biggest mistakes you all see? with progress notes, which is like such a loaded question. Um, because again, we all come from different backgrounds and have different perspectives. Uh, Barbara was the first to chuckle. So I'm going to ask her to take the lead on this one. What are some of the big mistakes you see, Barbara, when you are doing an audit of uh, client notes? Um, well, one thing you, you commented on, and it's very important, which is a lot of people who do cash pay don't take notes or else take very superficial notes. I always tell people, you should have the same quality of notes for every client because you never know. Sometimes a client will apply for disability. I've had cases where uh, a client wasn't able to get that disability because their psychiatrist notes sucked. And then when we appealed and they turned in my notes, they got permanent disability. I think we just don't realize how powerful our notes are and how important they are. And if I had kept crappy notes basically all that time, here's a client who would not be able to get disability. So um, it's super important to always take it good notes you don't know. But let's go back to what needs to be in there. I mean, this could be an all day conversation, but the main things that need to be, oh, wait, no, the question was mistakes. <laughs> I have seen um, one person got slammed by Medicare because she wrote everything that the client said, but she wrote nothing about what she did. So just leaving out completely that she was invisible in every session. Why should Medicare pay you if they don't even know what you did in the session? I would say the other one is checkboxes. Uh, that overuse of checkboxes is a huge issue that especially Medicare has problems with that we, you're, if you check every time I did CBT and I did supportive interventions. And that's going to be every week. I have no sense of you in the session. Again, I think we need to have a bit of narrative in each session telling me what you did. The same thing for a client. If I check off depressed and uh, anxious, and that's all I'm telling you. So checkboxes, insurance plans particularly don't like them. And I don't find them as helpful to me as a clinician if I go back later. So, you know, you have to balance what's helpful to you too. Barbara, I think you made some really good points, and I, I want to lean in on them a little bit. Um, check boxes. Let's let's like take a little jaunt over into that. Um, so everybody here has an opinion. So Barbara said check boxes are okay, and you want to see narrative. And your concern is that um, we can't remember what CBT intervention we did, or if we're just checking boxes, there isn't enough detail to basically put us in the session. Um, and I'm going to completely agree with Barbara on that one. Um, yes, it can make things very easy. In my opinion, I think there are some things that could be checkbox, like a mental status exam. Like I'm, I'm generally all for uh, working smarter, not harder. That said, it, to me, it's a really big, big red flag on an audit if we're looking at a, a note that is almost exclusively, if not exclusively, checkboxes, because I have no idea what you actually did in that session. And I have no idea how the client actually responded. And my experience with insurance and authorizations is like, this is a real person and I want the documentation to reflect that. And the checkboxes are not going to illustrate it. So I agree with Barbara on that one. We can do some check boxes, but I want a narrative. Um, Beth, I'm going to ask you to jump in. What's your opinion? I agree. I think check boxes are really wonderful for those things that that check boxes lend themselves to. You know, you can have a list of interventions that you use, and you can check off the modality. But what did you do using that modality? Okay, you use CBT, but what did you do using CBT? You used internal family systems. What did you do? when you were using that modality. Um, and everybody wants to have some level of understanding of what happened in the session, including the client, and the client gets to read their notes if they want it. So um, so I, I agree with both of you, probably all of you, because I, I see you shaking your heads. Um, I'm gonna ask Dr. McCaffrey, jump on in. So I will dissent slightly here, um, which is, I agree in, in the way in which checkboxes especially are provided in templates in most electronic health records. 
They are unhelpful, provide no information. Checking off a box that says you did CBT tells me absolutely nothing. That is like a thousand different interventions. Um, However, I do train using what I call a checkbox template, and it's not checkboxes, meaning CBT, that you check off CBT, that you did that. It's using starter phrases. So it's thinking through what are the common phrases. And I encourage people, typically in their progress notes, to go back and read through your own notes. I can give you, all of us can give you a list of of intervention phrases and narrative statements to use. And going through your own progress notes from before and making your own cheat sheet list of statements you frequently use. If you specialize in anxiety, you are probably doing similar things across clients consistently, and that's okay. Create your own cheat sheet (laughs) and have your own list. And so it's sort of like the the convenience of checkboxes, but not, um, but w- in a more helpful way, in an actual individualized to you and the treatment you offer and individualized to the type of clients you see. So I kind of, I like that middle ground of starter phrases and starter sentences. Thank you, Melissa. So to clarify what came to mind for me was like Mad Libs. Um, so, so effectively ways for clinicians to complete the sentence um, and there's still kind of that narrative involved. And, I, and I've said the same thing in the sense of like, can we uh, standardize and boilerplate? Like if you're an EMDR clinician, chances are you're doing some really specific interventions each time. And I still want narrative in there, but now we're getting away from the model um, and into actual interventions, not just did CBT or did EMDR, um, which I think is to your point to kind of help clinicians get a little... Uh, jumpstart on writing their notes to complete it. So thank you for that contribution and, and dissent. And how about for you, Ajeta, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I echo what, what everyone has said as far as I think there's balance that's in, important here. So utilizing it when it makes sense. So as an EMDR trained therapist, um, you know, I can stay in, in, in resourcing for quite a while with a client that is hot, that has complex trauma. Um, and I need to talk about like, I'm utilizing EMDR, but this is the process, the part of that module, right, that I'm utilizing. And how is the client responding to that, right? Um, because we may stay in in a space where we are, it doesn't look like we're making progress, right? If, if you know, depending on because the SUDS level is not going down, but it's also not increasing. And that is also important to be able to document that it not going down doesn't mean that they're not responsive if we lose the context of what's actually happening. And so I think the checkboxes provides, um, for me, a reminder of what intervention or service was provided. And I still need to pair that with what, how did the client respond to that? What are my observations? What are the subjective and objective components that I think we can't leave out for, for no other reason that it helps us with being able to provide continuity of care? Right. Um, I think that part is important. So I like the check boxes, but I think sometimes it makes us lazy um, in not only documentation, but it makes it hard. W- and, and thinking about w- when what happens from a supervisor's perspective, when I'm trying to provide additional support to a, a clinician that I'm supervising and supporting, they may not even remember because there's not enough information, right, to be able to to kind of ascertain client response effectiveness. Um, was it over, like, was it triggering, right? Was it effective? Was it culturally um, inclusive, right? I think when we don't, when we're not intentional, I think we lose a lot and the clients can potentially suffer as a result of that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. I appreciate that point. And ultimately, I think what you're saying is this This goes back to quality of care uh, and like we're probably not phoning, I hope we're not phoning it in, in session and then that our notes should reflect that <laughs> um, and, and be a little more detailed than just, just, just check boxes. Um, I want to jump back to one of the things that Barbara brought up, which is the appearance of the clinician in the room. Um, I I want to invite any of you to kind of jump and, and add on that or take it someplace else in the uh, omissions or mistakes that we might see. I see exactly the same thing, Barbara, where I can see a, a basically um, exactly what's going on with the client, but very little about the clinician. And for me, I'm thinking like, yeah, this is why the insurance company is paying you. So yes, I want to know about the uh, 
uh, client, absolutely. But I want to know what you did and basically why you're getting the big bucks to have done the thing. Um, that to me is kind of critical. So thank you for bringing up that point. Um, Ajeta, I noticed that you were nodding when we were talking about this. Can you talk a little bit about mistakes that you see or, or miss or omissions? That was the number one that I see is the clinician not being the intervention, um, the clinician's presence, especially given that we know that that therapeutic relationship is one of the most powerful tools to miss that in the documentation process, I think is a disservice. Um, the other thing that I wrote down um, is that I think sometimes when we are not doing standard assessments, we miss documenting that we are assessing. Um, we are assessing client response. We are assessing uh, a variety of different things, right? And we miss that because it isn't tied to a specific diagnosis or it's not tied to um, what have you. But I think that that there is ongoing assessment, right? We are, if I'm doing brain spotting with the client or even, you know, doing some EMDR, I'm assessing the client's response, right? Their visceral response, their physical, all of those things. And if I don't capture that, um, I'm not going to remember that next session, number one. And two, I don't have the ability to process what that part was like with the client, right? And, and what that means for how I might need to adjust and modify care. Um, and I, for me, I think that that's, it's a mistake because it makes it difficult for us to really talk about the uh, nuance of what it means to use therapists as intervention tool, mm. the therapeutic relationship as an intervention tool. Thank you. Um, I'm always like, promoting feedback informed treatment. So if you want to get really good at the, the <laughs> uh, relationship as part of the work, feedback informed treatment, um, to build on what you had just said, Dr. Robinson, what I see is the um, importance of a clinician showing up in the note in such a way, as you said, to the assessment that actually like tells a story. So I'm thinking about this at an agency where someone's doing care with someone for eight months, and then that person goes on leave, or they change departments or whatever happens. And so now the client is transferred. And so someone else is looking at that. And to me, if we're like putting this in medical terms, it's like a dermatologist that's treating a rash, let's say, and they've prescribed a cream, but then they, you know, the patient keeps coming back, but they never say whether or not the cream is working. What is the next dermatologist going to do? Because they don't know. They could potentially duplicate care. Um, so I appreciate what you're saying of kind of this continuous assessment, which we're doing, where it's like, oh, we did this, you know, I we we set this goal to to exercise once this week or whatever. And it's like, did that happen? Did you know, why didn't it happen? Um, kind of that status update for somebody else that really is a continuous assessment, but it's not just in the intake. Um, so thank you for making that point. Barbara, go ahead. That is a great point, first of all. But I also want to say, and this kind of tags on what Ajeta was saying, um, we have to be careful when we talk about interventions that we don't put things that are you're going to have in every single session, like I validated her, I supported her, I listened to her, I gave a compassionate space. I um, created safe Developed space. Developed warmth and rapport. <laughs> yes. This sometimes, I, what I tell people is, first of all, and, and I know Melissa teaches the same way, basically, it can't be something your grandmother could have done in the session, right? We both have the same art. Um, it needs to be something you had to go to grad school for, and it shouldn't be something you're going to do in every single session. It should be something unique to that session. I tell people, write down three things, especially when you work with insurance, that you had to go to grad school for. And it doesn't have to be crazy high. It could be educated client about stages of grief. I mean, again, grandma probably wouldn't do it. but And you lift that casual language a little higher, and you say, here's one thing I, I did in response to the dog dying. Um, Here's some advice I gave, some homework I gave for her to think about for next session. It doesn't have to be formal homework. Um, and the client said, that I taught her this particular skill in session. It, something that a therapist needs to be paid for. And I think we always have to have that, that framework. And that's a mistake I see many, many therapists make is that they say validated, praised, supported, and they think that's their interventions. And they put that every week. And insurance is not going to pay for that, you know, if this is an insurance client. 
I, I love that point, Barbara, and I'm glad you brought that up. And it's funny that you said three, uh, because that's exactly what I say. I say, I want to be able to look at a note and see at least three things, like, and I call them meaty, where it's like meaty things that you did. Like, did you create a pros and cons list? Did you provide psychoeducation? Like, did you um, identify steps they would take to yada, yada, you know, improve communication with their boss? Or did you write out an email that they were struggling with sending and, and finding the right language? Like whatever it is. Uh, but so I, I really appreciate that too, because it's concrete. Um, and so it's funny that you and I both say three. Um, I, I want to pass this one over. Uh, Beth, why don't you jump in and piggyback, tag along, whatever. <laughs> As always, there's a mo- like too many things I want to respond to. Um, so um Making a relationship with a client happens with good therapy. So what did you do? What in, the, what in the process did you do that helps make that relationship other than listening, providing unconditional positive regard? That's how we're supposed to show up. So, um, you know, unless the client is maybe court mandated and you really have to work at creating this relationship. I don't think it's necessary to put that in. Um, What can be so confusing for therapists when they're writing their notes is that we are always assessing. At every moment, we're assessing. We're making the decisions, dozens of decisions every moment during our sessions and dozens of assessments. And so part of the problem is that we have session note templates that'll have something like a big box that says clinical assessment. Well, everything to a therapist is a clinical (laughs) assessment, right? So what do you write? And that's why I think it's so important to have a template that tells you everything you need to include, even if it's not necessary for that week. And then you just check off N.A., And if you do include it, you write a little narrative about it. Because otherwise, you have to remember, and we have to remember so much stuff. So have good templates that help you know exactly what to include. And that goes back to this brilliant idea of writing intervention prompts and stems. And I, I certainly encourage the people I consult with to do it because when you're tired and when you're writing your note and you're tired, you go, oh, what did I do? And you look at your list, it may not be the exact thing you did, but it's going to trigger some thinking that, and the thinking won't be so hard. And I just tell people, take one hour, just one hour Go through your notes, write down the interventions you use the most, organize them by diagnosis or by modality, and have them wherever you're writing your note. Thank you. Um, I think that's really helpful guidance. And I would like to invite you, Dr. McCaffrey, please jump on in. Yeah. And I think going back to your original question that started this conversation, you know, what mistakes do you commonly see? And and one of the biggest ones I see is clinicians simply not writing progress notes. And it's not even because they're choosing not to, because they're thinking what we were talking about earlier, this is private pay versus insurance, so it's less important. It, it There are a multitude of potential reasons for that, but one very common one that relates to all of this as well is confidence. And when you sit down to write your note, one thing that is that you are faced with is what you did in that session. And if you don't feel good about what you did in that session, or if you aren't feeling confident in your clinical work in general, writing your notes will be very difficult. And then it's often something you will avoid because it will feel so stressful. And so the level of confidence that you have in the work you're doing, this is purely anecdotal based on my experience working with clinicians, but I find that it has a huge impact on how difficult your notes also feel to write and therefore whether or not you end up doing them (laughs) or avoiding them. So in that sense, I do think that having supervision, having guidance, having consultation, talking with other clinicians, getting training, personal growth work, all of these things that relate to our own professional growth can have a, a really big influence 
on our documentation in that way too. Thank you. I think that's a, a beautiful point. Um, one of the things that I see kind of picking out, piggybacking on what you said when it comes to like confidence is almost like the time and space. And I, sp- I say, this as a former clinical supervisor uh, for clinicians to ask themselves, why, like, why do I think this person needs this care? Why did I do that thing? Um, and then that's what I want to see in a progress note. So in the sense that it's like, well, I did this in order to help them have a better understanding of their automatic negative thoughts. And I'm like, there, there it is. There was your intervention. <laughs> like you, you did this and here was a justification for it. And so I find that people often are really good at what they're doing. It's just, as you said, kind of the difficulty and the confidence and finding the language um, and so when I'm sitting with clinicians individually, I'm saying, why did you do that? Why, why do you think this person has depression? I want to see that in your note. Um, why do you think they're getting better? What are you using to evaluate that? Or why is it getting worse? What factors are contributing? And for me, it's asking why. Um, please go ahead, any, anybody else, and jump on in. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, I just want to say it's interesting. I've never really thought about it that, that I haven't had the anecdotal evidence that people aren't doing their notes because they aren't confident in their work. The, I tend to get the feedback. I'm super confident in my work. I just don't do my notes. Like, like for them, it's a real split, which I don't quite get because for me, it's such a part of the informing my care. I'm always trying to remember what I did and I'm trying the next time I open the, the chart and I'm like, oh gosh, I forgot about that piece. Like, I'm so glad I, I have the notes because it makes me a better clinician when I walk into the next. And I don't think people really realize what a huge benefit that is to have great detailed notes when you walk into the next session and have, oh my gosh, I forgot that piece that I wanted to follow up with. And my clients sometimes say, wow, you have such great memory. No, I have crappy memory, <laughs> but I have really great notes. Um, which is another thing, you know, which we could, we're hopefully going to talk about later in terms of how detailed or how vague your notes should be. I'm a, I'm a pretty on the detailed side. But um, what I find for people who I did a survey about why people don't do their notes or what keeps them from doing notes the way that they should or as often or frequent as they should. And it was an interesting, like 25% of people said that they, uh, I think they said 25% said that they didn't find their think that notes were important. They had been several, many, a large percent said that they had been taught that uh, they should keep their notes as vague as possible. A large percent said that, um, you know, they were trying to, they were trying to protect client confidentiality. 2% said that they didn't keep them at all. And that was, they were fine with that. Um, But a lot of people were like, it's just too much. I think the biggest percentage was it's just too much work. I am spending all my time seeing clinic clients, doing emails, going to the bathroom. Maybe if I have time, I don't have time. And, you know, I think what we're seeing is more and more burned out clinicians than ever before. At least that's my anecdotally. And the thing that is going to slide is not going to be their clinical care first. It's going to be their note keeping. And so I think it's almost a literal decision making. Um, that's what I'm seeing. It's different than what you're seeing, Melissa. But yeah. I, I appreciate that, Barbara. Thank you for bringing that up. And I and I think you hit the nail on the head um, that we are burned out. It's been a really rough five years. <laughs> um, and we're exhausted. And I agree. I think it. Um, if we're wise, we're going to let the documentation drop, not the quality of care. And I don't even know if we make a conscious decision, but it's like, I would rather not do my note and be able to pay attention to you and give you the time you need and attention. Um, And we do have really stressed clinicians and we do have really stressed clients. um, And it, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, And, and I think that also comes in with what Melissa was saying about confidence and yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult thing to unpack, I think, for everybody. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that when I you can't see us, uh, if you're listening to this in an audio podcast, everybody was nodding while Barbara was talking. Um, so I just want to point that out because I think documentation for many of us is a bane of our existence and, and myself included, like myself included, I am not immune to that as well. Um, go ahead, Beth. So yes to all of the above. And This is one of the things that I think is really helpful to think about in terms of documentation 
is that it's an opportunity to provide oneself some self-supervision. It's actually an opportunity to think about what we did. And I know that so many of us don't have the time, me included, I don't like taking the time to write my notes, but I appreciate the thinking that I have to do. And the last thing is we are all really pulled to the max, right? So there's no perfect note. And I don't think we need to put the pressure on ourselves to have the perfect note. When I was a costume designer in the theater, you know, I, what I found is that I could work on creating the finest, most minute detail on this costume, and it would be beautiful, but it didn't need to be there. So my saying is, done is beautiful. Just get it done. It will be fine. It may not be perfect. <laughs> Thank you for bringing up that point, Beth. I want to dive into that a little bit more. And I, before we kind of move on from this thought, I want to jump back to something too that Barbara had brought up and my comment about crisis notes. As we've been talking today, we've been talking about what I would call a standard session. All bets are off <laughs> on crisis notes in the sense that when the acuity goes up, your detail should be going up. The length of your note is going to go up. Um, you're going to talk to your... Um, colleagues, you're going to potentially be doing some collateral phone calls, all of these things, they all need to be in your documentation. So when I say standard, I mean, not a time that you're calling the emergency response team, or there hasn't been discussion about heavy, heavy substance use or whatever else. So just to clarify why I said non crisis session, because if it's a crisis session, yes, you're going to be writing more, just know that, and you should be. Um, so back to Beth, what you just said about, uh, you know, a, a done note, what is all of your guidance when a clinician is like either way behind or they're listening to us uh, and they go, I've been documenting that all wrong for the last four years. Should they be writing those very old notes when it's two and a half years ago? Should they be modifying a note that they did write that now they're like, this is low quality? Um, Beth, I'm going to ask you to start on that one. Well, the first thing I say is it depends on how comfortable somebody is with risk. Because there's always risk that, that, that could, somebody could go back. The board can go back as long as they want. Insurance companies can go back as long as they want if they suspect fraud. However, it's really useful to know what the statute of limitations is on insurance audits by state, because it's different in each state. And some, some states don't even have statutes of limitations. But it's really useful to have that information because it can help guide you in your thinking, okay, well, how long do I go back? And the other thing is, truly, most therapists are not audited. Most therapists don't have their notes subpoenaed and get hauled off in front of the board. And if you have a client who is particularly angry or hostile, or if they're um, a disability insurance case, um, if you're dealing with somebody with a contentious divorce, then you probably want to go back and fix things. But otherwise, cut yourself a break. You're just going to get stomach aches and headaches and want to quit being a therapist. Thank you, Beth. And what do you think, Dr. Robinson? What's your guidance? So that... I'm not a fan of going back and revising kind of four-year notes, right? Um, I think that that calls into question, um, like, do we actually remember enough? Do we have those notes, right, that we could actually go back and revise that to fidelity um, and in a way that doesn't compromise, like, again, I don't remember what I did a month ago. <laughs> like, how would I be able to reasonably go back and revise notes that far? back, right? And so one of the things that we've <clears throat> done um, is around kind of remediation, right? Um, and so that might look like updating the treatment plan in real time um, and take that kind of moving forward, um, being able to document um, you know, we we document um, to some degree because we are a training facility. Um, we, instead of changing that note, there may be a note in the clinical record um, related to 
uh, specific feedback and, and insight, right? Um, because that communication is important. Um, and so we've seen this where um, clinicians fail to notify the client of the diagnosis, and that was not di- you know, documented. And so that is a communication note as opposed to updating the progress note. And so I think there's ways to update that medical record without uh, changing the progress note um, when it is so dated that we, we lose, I think we lose some, in, some clinical integrity there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for for that guidance. I think you make a really good point. It's like sometimes we're only thinking about progress notes and we're not thinking of these other avenues within the clinical record. And yes, to your points about fidelity and integrity, I, I see it exactly the same way. Um, how about for you, Dr. McCaffrey? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I really don't have anything to add. What Dr. Robinson and Beth said is pretty much exactly what I say <laughs> in the same circumstances. Um, and I, I do literally specialize in helping therapists get caught up on progress notes. And a lot of it is, it's not worth your time and energy is a phrase that I use often, unless it is. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. that, that's always my caveat. Yeah, to Beth's point, unless it is. Uh, and, and being honest with yourself and reflecting about which, which are these situations or cases that are more likely to be evaluated and call into question. Barbara, go ahead. Yeah, the sentence I use is go forth and sin no more was kind of the phrase. <laughs> like just that <laughs> sense of, okay, you've now learned how you should be doing your notes. Now see if you can go forth. I do have some uh, people who consult with me who say, I just don't feel comfortable leaving that huge gap where I didn't do notes or something like that. And then I refer them to Melissa because that's her specialty. But I also say you might want to start with Um, and I think you're alluding to this, maybe look at the insurance clients first, maybe look at your clients who um, are most likely to be litigious, maybe look at some of the clients who might, their notes would be more likely to be uh, looked at. But again, the most important thing to keep in mind is you cannot go back and recreate a note and make it look like you had that note on the day of the session that you wrote that note on the day of the session. That is unethical. So if you do add something to the record, you have to put the date that you added it. So I don't want you to walk away, anyone listening, to walk away with the idea that we're telling you to go back and rewrite notes and make it appear like you wrote them on the day of the session when you didn't. There are ways as... Um, Ajeta said that there are ways that you can put information in or add information or write a note, but then you have to put today's um, date on that note to make it clear that you wrote the note today. And that, thank you, Barbara, for bringing that up, because there are some of us that are still keeping paper notes, for example, or we're using a non-electronic health record. An EHR is automatically timestamping it. So know that. And every time you update it to unlock it, it's going to show that you unlocked it. It's going to show, show what the changes. And those can all be audited. There are whole businesses that are auditing those records. And and same across clients. That's another thing is like, we cannot have the same progress note for every single client. And you can still get caught for that. <laughs> so I just want to throw it out there because I've seen it. I think, you know, I, I, it's, it's astounding. Um, some of the things that we've probably seen where I'm like, oh, someone did this and thought it was okay or got, they were going to get away with it. Um, I, I know that we are we've covered so much in almost an hour and I want to get to one topic before we sign off for today, which is for our listeners, what are some of your pieces of advice that you think can improve progress notes? What are tools that you use? Um, Dr. McCaffrey, I'm going to ask you to jump in here first for a a, a little blurb about things like AI. Um, And also want to say to our listeners, I had Melissa on recently. She had a great episode about the use of artificial intelligence in uh, clinical documentation. So I encourage you to listen to that. Look at her resources. She has some really cool training on it. Um, But please jump in, Melissa. What are some of the tools that you think can be really helpful for clinicians? Yeah, I think for AI, like I said in that episode with you, which I would recommend if you're considering using AI for progress notes, check that episode out. Because at least at this point, I think it's one of the best tools or interviews I've done on AI so far. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, And some clinicians have have literally used the phrase life-changing for using AI to write progress notes. 
Uh, so there's that. And many other clinicians I work with have said it is taking me more time or it's just as much work to sit there and edit the note. So my advice to people always is do what works for you. And that means whether it is with a tool, whether it is with using starter phrases, whether it is with using a DAP note or a SOAP note or some other random template that you create yourself. Like many of us have mentioned, there is no perfect progress note. There is no perfect documentation. And you have likely gotten differing advice and sometimes maybe incorrect advice. So just do what works for you. This is part of the benefit of that flexibility <laughs> with progress notes. Use the schedule that works for you. If someone told you that you have to do your note, you have to do a session, do a note, do a session, do a note, do a session, do a note. While I often talk to group practice owners that that's a great way to structure things, that's not reality. In reality, that is not what most clinicians do. It's not realistic for most of us and that's okay. If that doesn't work for you, that didn't work for me, do something different but play around with things and give yourself some compassion through the process. Because um, I, I will say of all tools I use most consistently, it's, it's self-compassion work um, as I work with clinicians on, on all of these topics, because you need to be okay with the fact that there is no perfect progress note. And that is often very difficult for the type of people who become, <laughs> who get master's degrees and become therapists. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate the point you made too about format. Um, most of the time there with many pay sources, there's not a specific for format. You don't have to do soap. You don't have to do DAP. Soap breaks my brain. I will sit there and be like, which one was subjective and which one was objective? Um, I can't do it. I created my own and it works for me. Uh, and I definitely empower clinicians to do the same. It's like, that's okay. I, I, some people totally think in soap. I'm not one of them. Um, so if something really works for you, it's okay. Um, Barbara, why don't you jump in? What are some of the strategies and tools that you find to be most helpful for clinicians? Well, one thing I just want to say here that we haven't really touched on is that none of us got any training and documentation anywhere in grad school. And yet we're out here trying to figure out, expect ourselves to know how to do it. And we will take all kind of endless classes on how to provide clinical services, but most of us have never sought out a class in documentation. Most of us did, and yet we do this for hours each day. We have to do documentation. And so the number one thing I want to say to everyone out there is take the time and get training in documentation and your confidence will soar. You'll be able to do it faster. And this is something we have to do every day, whether it's if you want to think of it like cleaning the toilet and you don't like it, fine, but get really good at cleaning the toilet if you have to do it eight times a day because you have eight sessions, you know. So, you know, take Beth's class, take my class, take Melissa's class, whatever. Take someone's class. I don't care at this point. Just please, please, please go out and, and give yourself the gift of documentation training and treatment plan training. And I think you're going to feel so much less anxious and you're going to be able to knock this thing that you have to do every day out so much quicker and so much with so much less anxiety. And um, it's not a specific tool. The other thing I just want to say is that yes, template, get yourself a good template. I have the ones that go along with my trainings um, that you will automatically meet all insurance plan. Well, most insurance plan, uh, you know, requirements. The, my, my, the thing I would just want to say is, is that you can do have a great note on a bad template, or you can have a bad note on a great template. So in the end, it's up to you and what you put into it. Very good points. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. Uh, Beth, how about for you? What are some of the things that you think are helpful? Um, well, I think getting trained is really helpful. And because we weren't trained in school. So there's this huge information gap. And when there's an information gap, it causes a confidence gap. And when there's a confidence gap, we procrastinate. So it just becomes this horrible merry-go-round that, that creates what I call documentation anxiety. And, um, and the problem with anxiety is that people want to avoid thinking about the anxiety because they think that it will go away, but it doesn't go away. And not just the documentation doesn't go away, not thinking about the anxiety and always being anxious makes it not go away. So get the training um, so that it doesn't turn into documentation trauma. 
And the trauma happens when you're audited or you're called in front of the board. And it makes sense because if we automatically go into this little child place of, oh my God, what did I do wrong? Nobody told me. I didn't know. Don't hurt me, please. So it just, it, so not knowing how to do it, you don't have to do it perfectly, but really not knowing how to do it is one of the worst things you can do for yourself as a therapist. It can undermine your confidence as a therapist. And um, even though, like Barbara, I have plenty of people come to me and say, I know I'm a good therapist, but I can't write my notes. That's the kind of thing that makes good therapists want to leave being, want to leave the profession. And we need you. We need you. We didn't get into this because we don't like helping people. We got into this because we love it. Thank you for that point, Beth. And I also want to um, comment on one of the things you said earlier, which was kind of many of you have said it of like create these templates that help make your life easier, you know, to, to work smarter, not harder, and to spend that extra time, like you had said, take an hour. Um, I think that's a really important piece of guidance to, to kind of set ourselves up for, for success. So it's more of a preventative action instead of a responsive action when the bad thing has happened. I have one more thing to say about that. I probably could say 20 more things, but one of the things that happens for people is at least I experience it is, I don't want to write my notes because I want company, because I'm longing for connection. Because after a day of seeing clients, it's like, you know, can I talk to somebody where I can have a different kind of relationship, please? And um, so I found a few things to be really helpful. One is put on music, because that's company. And the other thing is to have a co-working session. Um, they really make a difference. I know, Melissa, you offer them. I offer them. Um, people find them invaluable. Even though you're not saying anything and you're just right, you're just typing, you're with people who are not judging you. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate it. I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, Ajeta, last but not least, uh, what are some of the yeah. tools strategies? So a lot of the ones that I had on my list um, have already been mentioned. So um, I love the idea of training, um, training but customizing or personalizing. Um, that kind of combines what uh, Barbara and Melissa said. I really want um, a gap in knowledge is not generally a, a, a valid defense when it comes to best practice, right, um, around documentation piece. Um, and so giving yourself the permission to have the support um, that you need and then customize it based on, like, you still get to be your unique self and, and, and with your gifts. And so I think that piece is important. Um, I think um, mindset and time um, is important. And so I know something that uh, in my practice, especially at being a training uh, institution, the way that we train on documentation, um, especially our, our developing clinicians is it's an opportunity for advocacy. Um, uh, around client care. It's an opportunity to advocate for your time freedom. Um, it's an opportunity for you to create boundaries um, uh, around your time. And so the more you manage your time, the more time control over your time you're, you have. And that gets really murky when we're kind of behind on our notes or we're not holding boundaries around client sessions. Um, and so time management is a tool and a strategy that I encourage. It's one of the reasons that we staff all of our clinicians with iPads um, so that they have a, a tool that they could utilize if they wanted to do concurrent notes or you know, a, a, a centralized place that's safe and protected um, for that. Um, and some of our clinicians also use these time apps um, where they'll set a timer and it will lock everything other than just, you know, the screen to do the note. Um, because, you know, fracture focus is a thing that we're constantly up against. There's always something competing for that. Um, and so that's another tool um, that I would recommend. Um, and then the last one, and I love that Beth kind of brought this up for me was around consultation and community. Um, I think it helps normalize that we didn't receive training around this. And so whatever we're internalizing, community creates an opportunity for us to kind of get some affirmation and some support um, and uh, to be able to, again, because we're a training institution, we use clinical supervision very intentionally um, around providing skill building uh, support resources um, for our clinicians and for our team. And that 
just makes a world of difference. And so I think there's a combination of things. Um, I think above all else, if we think about it as a way of creating balance um, between the work that we love doing and what we're required to do, it can create a sense of, I think, freedom for us and change the relationship that we have with documentation in a way that I think can improve um, our quality of life. And I think that's a thing that we have to figure out how to center, especially given everything we're up against as therapists. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ajeta. Um, we are out of time for today. And for our listeners, I sincerely hope that this has been helpful time for you. I know it has been helpful for me. I've been so honored to have these four women with me. And again, so that you can Google them and look them up, we have Dr. Ajeta Robinson, Dr. Melissa McCaffrey, Barbara Griswold, and Beth Rontel. I certainly encourage you to take a look at their work um, as they pointed out, kind of the opportunities you have for additional training um, and for community, because we do not um, operate alone in this business. Uh, and if we do, then we get very lonely and we feel bad about ourselves. <laughs> so I think community is a really critical part of this. I have been honored um, to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for joining me. And again, for our listeners, I encourage you to check all of them out. Um, thank you again, my friends. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.